Okay, I think we're going to get started. All right, so as people are lingering at the food table. Um, so, hi, I'm Julie Larson, the graduate chair. Uh, this is uh, the first lecture of the year in our series, our design research workshop series. Uh, I just want to give you guys a little bit of insight uh, for those of you who haven't really heard much about these workshops. And then I'll talk a little bit about Sandra and, um, and uh, what her, her background as well. So the workshops are these newly conceived, um, they're part of the uh, design research courses and they've been converted to workshops. And I wanted to see them as an opportunity for the graduate students to gain really more kind of exposure to guest professionals and critics, uh, instructors who were uh, invited uh, by myself to conduct a workshop here, which Sandra uh, and her partner will be doing over the weekend with the students. Uh, the workshops for me are about providing a kind of view into uh, different research methodologies uh, and how they can provide leverage into emerging uh, processes and practices uh, that typically maybe lie outside of traditional architectural production and pedagogy. Uh, so students are able to see how like design research really bridges practice and it really help them to start to expand their, their knowledge of the field of architecture. So this year, um, which I didn't do last year, but I decided that it, it might be in, helpful to start to create a kind of series out of the workshop. So what you're gonna see over the next, uh, over this year, as, the, as we start to uh, unroll each of them, is that they're all under the auspices this year of a theme, uh, the aesthetic agenda of AI. Um, and this is really in response to how artificial intelligence uh, has really started to show how it's poised to real, potentially revolutionize the field of architecture and maybe fundamentally change the way we design in the future and how we might materialize AI to enrich our conceptual and aesthetic explorations. Uh, so this year, just so you all know, um, we have Sandra, manager, and, and Atias Del Campo of Span Architecture joining us this weekend. Sandra's, Sandra's going to be lecturing today. Uh, we also will have in the spring Sabrina Rate uh, out of Canada, an artist, um, and Corey Beach, who's the director at University of uh, Texas at Austin. Those, those will be in the spring. Um, but we are very fortunate today to have uh, Sandra, manager, joining us uh, to discuss the work of SPAN and the role of AI in their practice. Uh, she is an architect, a researcher, and an educator. Uh, she was born and educated in Austria and co-founded SPAN uh, Architecture with Matthias Del Campo in 2003. She currently serves as associate professor at the architecture department at New York Institute of Technology. And the architecture of SPAN is characterized by a combination of things uh, with advanced te techniques and philosophical inquiry that interrogates the ontological and epistemological framework that produces a paradigm uh, concerned with advanced, uh, advanced technology as really an agent of culture. Uh, it, in close cooperation with the faculties of robotics and computer science at University of Michigan, SPAN developed a new design method for architecture based on artificial intelligence where they uh, turned uh, their research into uh, what is the robot garden um, for Michigan Robotics. Um, it's the first built project that uses generative adversarial networks or GAN or GANs for short as a design method. Her award-winning projects have been published and exhibited internationally, including uh, the Venice Biennale, Mac, and uh, Autodesk Pier 1. Uh, and uh, their work has been per in permanent collections as well at the FRAC, at the, I'm going to maybe not say this right, but Pinacotec in De Maudon in Munich, and the Albertina in Vienna. And she, uh, Sandra, has taught internationally at the TU Vienna, University of Applied Arts, Dia Bauhaus in Dessau, UPenn, Tongji and Chihua Universities, University of Michigan, and the Royal Melbourne Institute of Architecture. She really has uh, been very much a force uh, with AI in many, many schools. And we are so gracious to have her here today. So please welcome uh, Sandra Manager. Well, thank you so much for the kind introduction words. Uh, 
I hear you already had, uh, uh, you have already a lot of exposure to the field, thanks to the pop club professors that are teaching you. So you had already conversation, thanks to, uh, to Laurie, who, who, Julie, who was so kind to organize all these events around uh, this new emerging field of uh, inquiry. And uh, I just read, introduce myself. My name is Sandra Manninger. I'm an associate professor uh, of architecture at the School of uh, um, architecture and design at the New York Institute of Technology. So together with uh, Matthias uh, Del Campo, who will join us uh, later tonight <laughs> and for you tomorrow morning, uh, we run the architecture practice span. And but more importantly, uh, we have co-founded uh, the, the Aerial Lab, the Laboratory for Architecture and Artificial Intelligence, a platform that uh, brings, has the potential to bring together individual as well as institutional research. And in today's lecture, I would like to run through some examples how to incorporate available machine learning technology in architectural design. So uh, in machine learning, the latent space represents a multi-dimensional landscape where data points are distributed. As the neural networks learns and adapts, it shapes and rearranges this latent landscape to capture patterns and representations of the input data, revealing hidden structures and relationships. In today's talk, I would like to raise the question how we will navigate around this constantly evolving space and what is our role when we conceptualize, design for, fabricate, and maintain the built environment. So the question is, what is machine learning? Uh, there are, of course, a couple of uh, definitions for machine learning. One, for example, defines machine learning as a subfield of computer science that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. And another definition describes machine learning as a branch of AI that involves creating algorithms that can learn from data. These, all these definitions describe what ML does, but what is it? So to an artificial neural network can be described as a sequence of mathematical algorithms that are capable of registering latent correlations in a set of data. So this is a simplified version um, of, such a, of the constituent elements of such a machine learning model. We have a representational image of data on the left side. So here you see here these numbers from the famous MNIST uh, uh, data set. And on the right side, um, we see the mathematical model that is uh, with its corresponding loss function. Here we have a very simple version of probably, uh, this, this could be a simple uh, linear regression model, for example, that is uh, uh, something that is uh, probably not sophisticated enough for, for today's uh, data sets that we have and, and the questions we have, we have to AI, but that represents actually what it is. That is machine learning, that is nothing that is, uh, mythical, mysterious, or doing anything you don't want to take it. You know, it's, it's not doing anything to us. We are, the, we are the people who are providing the data, and the computational designers are, uh, computational scientists are the people who are helping us with the, finding the appropriate algorithm for the task that we want to achieve. So, please bear with me. I will uh, I talked about data a lot in this lecture. So there are two fields, yeah? So we want to just remember the two fields that shape machine learning. Number one is the mathematical model, and number two is the data or data sets. So that is, this is a representation of some examples of the famous MNIST uh, data set of handwritten digits. Uh, it contains 60,000 handwritten digits for training a machine learning model and 10,000 handwritten digits for testing the model. So just to give you an idea about the data set design, today the data set is considered as too simple um, by some for testing the modern very complex deep learning models with up to billions of parameters. So, but importantly, we have uh, to note that when uh, talking about data set design is the acquisition, availability, the quality, quantity, and sometimes scarcity of data, and of course the racial, cultural, and gender bias of data sets. Specifically important when we discuss labeled data for supervised learning. So raising also the question of ethic in employment of these data acquisitions. You know, we have uh, 
uh, it's called the Mechanical Turk, uh, where uh, Google is not actually scraping data and having uh, a tool that is automatically labeling data for it, but it has really physical people sitting in India lab labeling uh, the data for them, or in Pakistan, or in the United States, you, you don't know. But, uh, but this is uh, the reality of the, of the creation of these data sets. And so far, uh, believe it or not, uh, architecture, will, we will find out later, is a field that is uh, lacking data. So now that we have established roughly what machine learning is, what the compositional elements is, uh, and what it is composed of, and also have, having learned that the very basis of the data is a field that needs to be resolved, so it's not resolved yet how we acquire data, how we maintain data, how we label data. Uh, this question, of course, arises in why, why still using ML, you know, if, if it's such a, if it's so burdensome, why use it then? Well, generally speaking, it's better to teach machines how to learn instead of how to do things. So I would like to use an example from the car fabrication industry, the a welding robot. So this example shows how cars were manufactured until the late 1960s and early 1970s. It was expert knowledge that was applied to particular parts of the assembly process of the car production. It was done in an assembly line, but it was done by people, by trained experts who knew exactly how to weld, how to paint, and how to assemble elements together. To my knowledge, it was uh, General Motors uh, who introduced the first robot to, assembly, to, the, to an assembly line in 1963. The robot was called Animate and was put into practice in New Jersey. Instead of experts putting together cars, now a set of industrial robotic, robotic arms performed a sequence of pre-programmed tasks to repeatedly perform a specific task. The problem with these assembly lines came up when a new car model had to be produced. All two paths had to be redesigned and the robotic arms had to be reprogrammed. I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, any sort of um, uh, robotic fabrication. I was teaching in Michigan, in the University of Michigan for many years. So we had seven uh, of these robotic arms in our fabrication labs and uh, we started to experiment with materials and programming a, a, a tool path was also always uh, a, a, a task that, that, that acquired expertise, you know. And for, this, um, for these companies, obviously, it was so much cost loss in, in effectiveness that they started to think about how could we incorporate something more, more uh, flexible. And what uh, was happening over the last 60 plus years, the car industry had collected all the data from these machine paths and welding points that were created when programming the industrial robot arms. And, and machine learning now allowed to use this rich amount of accumulated know-how into, train, into training robotic arms to perform the task of welding. So we were not uh, uh, designing a tool path for the tool, but they started to learn uh, what was the best point in, 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 uh, in space that they started to um, learn from the data sets that have been accumulated all the time, all these tool paths over all this generation of cars had been accumulated and were available as, as uh, local information of uh, points and they trained them, uh, the, those points and the movement was something that was trained then. So that was not programmed anymore. And um, the advantage would not only be that there would be no interruption when changing cycles, but that every car in the assembly line can now be entirely different. And today, though I would like to talk about machine learning not necessarily only as a tool of expedience or for optimization, and of course that is an important part how uh, ML will uh, enter the field of architecture. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm also telling you just right at the start that probably we are using uh, machine learning in a very naive way at the moment, although we try to incorporate as many features as possible, 
but I'm not sure we are there yet. So, so we're just at the starting of exploring this new design space that is available to us. So, uh, and to start this conversa conversation, and I think also that was the intention of this workshop is to understand the aesthetic qualities that we have. And I would extend it that um, when we use this new tool, how can we uh, integrate and incorporate it in, in, into our design protocols. And what does it mean culturally when we add this technology for architectural production? Art is always uh, a way faster medium to adapt to and adopt novel technologies and techniques. So you might have seen this uh, portrait before, the portrait of Edmond de Bellamy, which was created by Paris-based art collective Obvious in 2018. It became famous after selling at Christie's for 400 and around 50,000 US dollars. Allegedly the first entirely AI-based uh, uh, piece of art and the way Edmond Bellamy, for those who are a bit nerdy, like we are all, all are, uh, is uh, a tribute to the inventor of general advers adversarial networks, Ian Goodfellow. So the point um, that this art piece was accepted and sold by the famous institution Christie's raised funda fundamental questions regarding the agency, authorship, and sensibility of these new techniques. Who is the author? The art collective that came up with uh, the idea to use a neural network, the programmer who set up the algorithm, or the hundreds or even thousands of artists present in the 1,500 image database they had generated. Who has the copyright of something that was not created by humans? All of those questions that are not answered yet, but that we have to figure out along the way when we are starting and incorporating those tools. So the rise of neural art became very visible after 2018. Artists such as Sofia Crespo, Mario Klingemann, Memo Atken embraced the use of AI as legitimate from an, from an artistic expression. It cannot be reduced to the visual arts alone. Neural musicians such as Holly Herndon, Arca, Yacht, and data bots use neural networks to make their artwork. One of the earliest adopters of neural networks are actually, were actually created from authors uh, creating literature. Um, Mario Klingemann's work we can see here is also very inspirational in the beginning of, uh, as he also in the beginning coded his own neural networks and used self-created data sets. Uh, uni when we looked at all this, uh, when we started to synthesize what was inspiration, uh, inspirational for us, what inspired us, what, why we were interested in these positions, uh, we were drawn to where elements of estrangement and defamiliarization were popping out of the work. So around the same time in 2018, we also put together a data set. So this is our own work. In this case, uh, images of Gothic architecture and exploring the first publicly available style GAN version. It was very explorative work just trying to understand what the model does, how it responds to changes in the code, but specifically how it uh, could become relevant in our work as architects. And for me personally, what kind of sensibilities it could carve out revealing this latent space. Uh, when creating your own database, you will be confronted with bias in data, including racial or cultural bias, and I cannot make an exemption out of myself. I, I'm, I'm also biased, obviously. I'm human. <laughs> if you look for a specific style in architecture, uh, you will be presented with images that represent and favor Western art and culture. So the problem becomes even more visible when the data sets become larger in large language models and the image generators that are being used currently. So when we, uh, we try to remember that all the AI can do is going through this vast landscape of data that we feed them. So we generate a world for the AI. It cannot go beyond this world. Whatever we ask him or it to do, uh, it's, 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 it's impossible if the data is not corrected cor uh, corresponding to the algorithm. So 
that is where actually the field of architectural production at the moment is we need to set up these databases. And uh, this is a problem insofar as uh, a, we have 3D modeling databases that are small. So they are in quality and quantity, they are scarce. Uh, and uh, it's also because this, even if they exist 3D models in architectural production, they are not uh, modeled by architects and they have not been labeled by architects. So uh, I think it's even worse than for plans. For plans, there's also data sets that are not the high quality that we would like to have. And that's specifically a shame because our architecture produces a lot of data, you know? It's, it's just uh, nobody ever uh, has a platform where those um, would be accumulated. And no architect would freely give you the data if you ask them, you know? So even they might volunteer, some of them might, but I think a huge of the majority would not probably want to give their 3D models away. So this is a huge problem in moving forward with uh, this technician technology, because if you don't have this data set, you cannot produce anything that is three-dimensional. It's impossible. You know, so otherwise you would have probably find other ways how to, to um, accumulate uh, data with, um, uh, with uh, point clouds. But that's also something that Google stores then and not architects. So, so it's, it, 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 it's really a problem to move forward. It's, it's really something that is hindering us dramatically. And that's why we uh, started to establish this uh, R2L um, uh, laboratory where we can have find volunteers, also people from the industry who can come and uh, help us with res our research tasks. So, Labeling is also a political act. Uh, so that's, that's, that's uh, when you set up your data set and you set up, uh, that's also why we started to do the r 2 lab because we wanted to have a variety of architecture presence, not only that from Western point, point of view, but we also uh, ask and invite uh, professional students from other types of uh, parts of the world to enter what they think is a quality architecture they would like to have presented in, in, their, in, in, in this data set. So, so far, uh, the question is again, creating our own data set is quite an interesting process. And this, uh, in this example, uh, we created sets of sections and plans, and it was interesting to explore the first image representation of these explorations. Of course, when you look closer, these plans uh, and sections don't make any sense. The machine learning, learning model has not captured the intricacies of specific connections of architectural elements. It captures features in a digital image like color, lines, edges. It does not recognize what it is. It's not learning what architecture is. It is learning the features of architectural representation. It's, you can call it a hyper Albertian project, if you will. And it is learning them fast and very well. So much better as in our crude beginnings here. Of course, this was really a starting point. Uh, I still like to present this example as they create other potentialities. So whatever we do, we always try to analyze what we produce, even if it's, it looks like this here. It still ha has hold some value for us, for some information that I wasn't, would not be aware of. This latent space is producing and providing information for me of in-between steps of uh, potentials that I'm, that I'm not uh, tapping into if I would not use the tools. And that's why I'm always excited. It's not only about machine learning. It's, I always uh, have, have used technology as, a, as, a, as, 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 as something that is providing us with something that can extend what we can do. So again, this was uh, what we found relevant in the place that all of them seem to have some estranging and defamiliarizing uh, features. So 
When we think about this defamiliarization uh, proclaims that one can take an everyday situation that is familiar and add something strange to it to increase the attention of the observer. An example is the work of the German theater director Bert Brecht. He created a stage design displaying a wagon that looked like from the 16th century and actors who would wear costumes from the 16th century on an other naked stage. How, how you would experience it during a rehearsal probably. Revealing, revealing that the whole situation is artificial that it is synthetic and not allowing for the immersive environment that you would usually uh, expect in a theater. Bertolt Brecht wanted people to know that what they are looking at is a play by adding strange or unusual elements to increase the attention of the viewer. This is not completely new, but similar ideas can be found in Marx when he discusses the estrangement of the worker. Viktor Schlowski actually coined the term defamiliarization in an article with the title Art as Technique. And ex um, and a year after uh, Schlossky, or Schlossky, uh, uh wrote his article, Sigmund Freud wrote an essay called Das Unheimliche or the uncanny, which talks about the same effect when strange elements occupy a familiar situation, increasing attention and awareness. Freud defines the uncanny as deeply rooted in what, he, what is known to individuals as common or familiar. Deviations from familiar, defamiliarizing aspects of life result in emotional responses akin to fear and curiosity. So this is an example of our work uh, show, shows, that shows, displays these uncanny qualities in an architectural example created in Midjourney last year. So there are many architectural features like the concrete material, the horizontal window bands, the cantilevering shape uh, that are very familiar features to architects. Nonetheless, there are also elements created by the machine learning model that are somehow not resolved or solved in an unfamiliar way like the relationship of building mass and ground or the concave roof line, both raising the question whether the building was carved out rather than built up. So what does it mean when we move from uh, learning, from, lear from expert systems to learning systems? What does uh, it mean culturally for the architectural discipline? I would argue that it's uh, the first genuinely 21st century design method. All the computational design methods we have seen in the last 23 years have been developed and applied already in the 20th century. Parametric modeling, agent-based modeling, scripting, versioning, blobs, folds, and so on. They all have been polished and improved in, in the last 20 years. But neural architecture is a new paradigm, not only intellectually and culturally, but also technically. What we see today was not possible even a decade ago. The availability of massive processing power in addition to newly developed algorithms, and not to forget the data sets that became available. Phenomena like social media made the creation of large data sets possible that did not exist in the 20th century. So um, now that we have established some of the cons uh, constituting elements of ML, I would like to share an example how we incorporate them into the, our first ML-designed architectural project. This is uh, the Robot Garden, uh, a commission by the robotics department at the University of Michigan. The uh, department was already in the process of building a new addition to the campus called the Ford Robots Building. Now, now, next to the building, they wanted to have a testing round for their robots, as you can see here. Uh, they needed to test their robot's ability to master the so-called last hundred steps problem, which means if you were to automate, for example, uh, Amazon delivery, then the most difficult part is from the delivery van to the door of the house. So uh, the last hundred steps. So this garden needed to have a variety of different ground conditions like gravel, sand, earth, and rocks. 
and it had to have steps of varying sizes and lengths. We also added a water feature, which will additionally provide icy surfaces to test the robotics motoric movements on ice. Uh, this winter, actually, is the first time they will experiment it. So we used a series of today's standards, almost primitive methods. We use deep dreaming, we use style transfer, and 2D to 3D style transfer in this design. Uh, so this is an animation of the style gun technique we used. Uh, he applied uh, to a set of satellite images for the robotic garden. We needed that. Um, we created this data set of 1,000 satellite images with different ground conditions to, uh, to uh, teach the AI to place sand, gravel, and, um, and rocks. And this is a visualization of just a small part of this uh, data set. So the provided site was analyzed using a set of satellite images as a basis, and the given shape of the area was cut out of the satellite images to create a set of pictures geared towards 2D to 3D neural mesh rendering. So um, this is one of the methods that is available to us uh, to create 3D geometry in a most, uh, yeah, almost 3D geometry, I would call it 2.5D geometry uh, in an architectural space or for an architectural design. So in an attempt to have a neural network dream or hallucinate architectural features on the site, it has to be trained on architectural features. So uh, we also had to uh, create um, a library of stairs, columns, and fountains. That's what we had. So <laughs> Uh, and surprisingly, the result, uh, resulting images represent a novel view of these archaic architectural features. Uh, the hybrid nature of the resulting meshes do not show the features in total clarity, but are rather hallucinogenic dream of a machine trying to see the features of the landscape. Um, so here you can um, see a couple of those results. So I, I, I told you also we had a set of thousand images, but it's, uh, it's nothing you'd usually use in a proper machine learning model. It's just too small. And we would have needed at least 1,500. That was uh, what uh, this, our, our colleagues from science, um, from computer science, told us uh, to test it. But um, even this number is ridiculous. Even 1,500 would have been ridiculously small compared to useful contemporary data sets. So in this case, we willingly scarfed the model and took out the output. So we said, okay, that's what we have. So we cannot create anymore. We have to test it. We have to run it. There is a construction site. So we tried and tested with 1,000 images. And here are some examples of what the model created. Uh, dreaming features into the image of the construction site and then extruding out features. Because of the scarcity of data, it often results into unexpected, very unexpected results, like you also saw in our first uh, plans and sections. We could have gone to the process where it becomes perfect, but that's not what our goal was about. Our goal was really to, to figuring out what the tool provides, what the algorithm sees, or what he's carrying out, rather than us wanting to get more perfect uh, 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 visualizations of things that I'm already know what I'm want to do, you know, so I don't need these tools to help me visualize them. I need those tools to go beyond that, what I can visualize or what I can think of. So this is an image of such an unexpected result, a beautiful error or beautiful glitch. The robot garden at the end of the day is a project um, for machines designed by machines. So I like the idea that the ML model produces this as a result of the input. Now it's up to the architect to evaluate and label these results and continue to train or tend to, to it and grow it. You know? So it's, it's more like you, you like it, you label it as a good result. If you don't like it, you label it as something that you don't like. So it becomes, becomes a bit of your, uh, you're tending to it like, like in a garden. You know? So you're tending your plants, they have their own mind and they will not uh, precisely follow your instructions but you can you when you know some um, methods how to tend them they will blow and blossom and, and probably provide some flowers that you would have not thought that you had in the, there's a new new thing gonna gonna show up so this project uh, the robot garden was on show in several times here an image from the Biennale in Vienna it was also in uh, the Biennale Argentina in Buenos Aires and the Biennale in Venice. 
So all of these things uh, you just saw happened before MidJourney was available. We have been working with diffusion models before MidJourney, for example, disco diffusion. Uh, but after the immediate success of MidJourney, it became clear that the application of machine learning technology had reached the mainstream. Although this is not a tool for architectural production, many architects started using it to explore design capacities uh, of, of this new available tool. Something else also became very clear. When it comes to image generation based on language, the limits of the language mean the limits of my world. So we have applied, as I told you before, before the advent of a mid journey, uh, I would like to show you an early example how we use language based modeling. Uh, here on a project this was called Peaches and Plums, uh, a design for a high school in Shenzhen in China. Again, this was before mid journey or Jet GPT 2 or even 3 were available. Uh, but we knew about attention guns who were in principle the same thing, producing 2D images of text, uh, out of text prompts. So what are attentional models? Um, as an example, attentional generative adversarial networks or attention guns allow attention-driven multi-stage refinement for fine-grained text-to-image generation. So attention gun can synthesize fine-grained details of different sub-regions of the image by playing attention to the relevant world, world in this natural language description. In addition, a deep attentional multimodal similarity model computes a fine-grained image text matching loss for training the generator. So Coco, uh, in this case, the Coco data set. A detailed analyze, uh, analysis is also performed by visualizing the attention layers of the attention gun. Please note that this project was done before JetGPT or GPT-3. So, as an example, attentional generative adversarial networks allow attention-driven uh, explorations. So uh, we used this and extracted uh, a 3D geometry from the 2D images that were presented to us uh, through a set of just uh, prompts. One of them was uh, peaches of plums in the school. And uh, we started, uh, I should also mention that in 2019, we started experimenting with text to image models thanks to uh, people like Alexandra Carlson, a PhD student back then at Michigan Robotics, uh, who introduced us to the concept of this neural network. In spring 2020, we were invited to participate in the international competition for the new 24 high school project in Shenzhen. Uh, and I would like to mention uh, Yingying Yuan, uh, and, uh, who was uh, helping us training uh, the model. And um, what I... So in, later on, just a year or two years later, in early 2022, the first diffusion models were discussed. So disco diffusion was one among them. This uh, animation was among the first uh, I created in late winter, and it literally defines the program for me of what diffusion models are capable of. Continuous iteration based on a very large scale data set. So this is nothing, what, what you're presented with is a huge output collection. And, and the idea of iteratively working through a problem is well known to architects. So this is something we are very familiar with. Uh, so this is, um, here's just an example of a series of 28 iterative models for the Saturn Tower in Vienna by the uh, architect uh, Hans Hollen uh, from 2004. And I think we all know about this when we're sketching, we're making a sequence of sketches. The first thing is never the, the one that's gonna be, sometimes it, it might be, yeah, it's, it might be that you go back later. But, but usually, uh, you're, uh, you're starting to, to capture the problem. It, uh, now uh, the problem is reversed. You're getting a lot of, of those models 
for free that is somebody else is doing so you can go to bed and in the morning you get all these models you know and you're just uh, starting to deliberate the, the, the question still is which one will you choose so it actually amplifies the tendency of architects to use variations in the last year from april to august we generated 73423 images and in this piece of art, uh, it's called the mosaic, we used 20,264 of those uh, images that we created in one year uh, to create a, a mosaic of gradient that was also designed using Midjourney. So since all of you are using um, uh, a Midjourney, more or less, but that's probably the most uh, famous image generator. I wanted to give you a brief introduction into diffusion models because you know, need to know how those tools operate to know what you can do with and what can, can you expect from them. So it's, uh, I, I know it's, it's a bit scary if you have those tools and you don't know what, what is going on behind the scenes. So I try to a bit of um, demystify here a bit of uh, what it is. What, so just, uh, a brief introduction into diffusion models because you are all are working with it. So in 2015, there was a specific progress in machine vision. After enough images were labeled, it was possible to create an algorithm that can automatically capt caption images. So the model can recognize elements in an image. It recognizes features based on, I assume, thousands of hours manually labeling or annotating content of an image. So I assume there was literally a lot of computational design, uh, science students who were labeling people walking on a bridge and the red, the, the, the ones in the red frame is not a person walking on a bridge, you know, or even in the state tour that we see here on the left side could have been confused. So it needs to be correctly labeled from a, an expert, you know, who knows, who understands the concept of this is a walking person or this is uh, just so, so just to give you an idea how you would label any data then for architecture, you know, this is a great building. This is not a great building. So who, at the moment, this is labeled and done, but not by architects. It's maybe done by, um, uh, uh, developers rather than because they are already using those tools uh, and data sets that they have at their hand. So uh, it's, it's rather time that we are <laughs> trying to uh, label our own work. So, th so th this, this, in this case, the criteria is people walking on a bridge. And, and in 2015, it was presented as something that the, uh, the, the algorithm could analyze. It was specifically important and, and, and for self-driving cars. So the collaborator we have been worked on for many, many years, she's coming from the machine vision side. So she is, uh, exp has quite some expertise in, in, in generating those models. So some of the scientists, but immediately after this comes into production, the scientific mind always thinks, okay, what can I do? Some of the scientists ask the question, would it be equally possible to create images by using these labels that were created when these images sets were created? Or in other words, now we have images plus semantic information. Can we use language to generate images? So, So uh, it was specifically uh, Elman Mansinov uh, with uh, his colleagues in a paper called Generating Images from Captions with Attention in 2016, just a year later. And here we see one of these first explorations in the field. So these are the first sequence of, uh, of images that were generated by just using text. And it's possible because it works on labeled data, right? So we were working with a, in, in 2018 with a very small data set, the COCO data set. And uh, this is working, Midjourney operates on, the, on the, the internet, you know? So that's a completely different range. That's why you get all the quality out of it. Or the, let, let's say, whatever you define as qualitatively, uh, whatever kind of quality you want to, uh, to address. 
So an example using an architectural image to explain it again. So the diffusion process, so the first uh, is to add noise to an image that you enter, enter into the machine uh, learning model and uh, it's generating noise and noise and then it tries to recapture from these noise patterns. So a uh, process like these were used before, uh, for example, in deep dreaming, something that we also used before. We were also having always a noise pattern at the start that this then uh, trans changes uh, the, 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 the image into becoming noise and then from this noise generating out new architecture pot potentialities, you know, so. Uh, and also uh, what makes it uh, the new diffusion model so successful is transformers. Uh, they can parallel process various aspects at once. What you see in this diagram happens multiple times in parallel, thus speeding up the process. And here is uh, the, one of the first uh, things we used uh, uh, to use models like MidJourney. Uh, of course, it is being observed, the use of Mijun is being observed critically, and I think for good reason. It opens up multiple routes for designers and is full of bias and unethical working conditions. So, but um, it is um, not the tool that is to be, uh, um, that's, uh, that's not the failure of the tool per se. So it's, it's always us that are using those tools, probably in a wrong way, and also us how to, to, to uh, roost them in a wrong way. So you can be very lazy and it's very easy to get, uh, say the prompt Mies van der Rohe building. And, but whether you like the actual state of the tools, they are available and they will be explored and they will be trained. It is better experts in our case, you, <laughs> uh, are, are, are co-designing and training them than data scientists or developers alone. So I would also like to use uh, MidJourney uh, and uh, diffusion models in general, how fast those tools are developing. So this is a prompt uh, that we call section drawing through an opera house. That was a prompt that we uh, put into MidJourney in May of 2022. And that generated this uh, sequence of of results, we are usually quite happy with those kinds of results. We don't need an, uh, an actual uh, section through an opera house. It's not how we, uh, as our practice, operate. But I understand that for some people, this is not what they want. For us, it's it's really just a tool for uh, to to explore and research rather than than for execution. But uh, still, the developers they they change the versions of MidJourney. So this uh, this is the same exactly the same prompt that we used uh, just a couple of months later in November of the same year. And that's uh, where the results then. So in just a couple of months, the data sets had become much better trained. And what you can see here, it's not much more uh, representative of what you would expect from a, from a, a from a plan, you know, from a section through Opera House. What you also can probably obtain is that the architectural community was not really happy about it, <laughs> about this upgraded version, because they, they really wanted to uh, rather uh, have something that explorative rather than too picturesque. And it was called like um, uh, uh, kitsch and uh, Disneyfication of architecture. and I cannot deny this is this a problem, but it's really, we have to train it, right? To, to, to tell him uh, what we want from a section, what we expect. And the next uh, thing is also here, prompt the most beautiful house in the world. The first time we ever prompted this it was also in May, 2022. <laughs> and that was the result. So, I mean, it, it was, it's probably not my thing, you know, but, but at least it was something, uh, that is, is curious, you know, it it's, um, falls into the realm of, of, of uh, estrangement. Uh, and when we entered the same exact prompt in uh, November, again, that was the result and it was most disturbing. This is not an upgrade. <laughs> so at the moment that is when, from my settings, when I prompted this, that, uh, 
the community in general, the whole World Wide Web, everybody thinks that this would be something that makes me happy. <laughs> so, it's so, so I think we really have to train those tools and um, it needs time to train a model to produce desirable results. But again, I think these models are far more sophisticated than just to visualize something. So I'm, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm, I'm giving a talk to, today that I actually would like to avoid. <laughs> I would so much more like to talk about what we actually can use data for. You know, we have so many social, economical, ecological responsibilities. Uh, responsibilities. We have so many responsibilities to care for our communities, for the people that we're living with, and all those tools will be available and will help us doing and, and, and provide this uh, service. So that's a talk that I would like to have in the future. Unfortunately, now all we can work, uh, discuss upon is this sequence of images. <laughs> it's not. It's not because I, I prefer them over actual physical things but or, or a three-dimensional mod, but it's just not possible because we don't have the database yet. So keep this in mind when I now uh, give you some uh, of the examples how we employ these tools. So for example, we are uh, setting up, so this would be the, 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 the site, the imaginary site for a project. And uh, we are setting up a data set with, um, that is both rich data, uh, yeah, uh, that is uh, trying to get a set of qualities out of, in this case, it was brutalist architecture. You can do whatever you prefer, you know. But before we move forward, I cannot mention it more often enough uh, that our environment is both. So we have, on the one side, it is data rich but it also is data scarce at the same time. So on, on the one hand, we have an excessive amount of, for example, images and PDF files from where we can draw information, and that information can then inform the design. Also, architecture has produced, and of course still produces, an incredible amount of data, but not of all of this data is collected, or if it's collected, it's not accessible. So there are no 3D databases that are generated and labeled by architects. So why is that important? There is, see, I, I repeat myself in this lecture, but there's absolutely no way, <laughs> uh, there's literally no way we can uh, train or test algorithms on 3D models because the database is not there. So well, that's, that's uh, you're cooking without having nutritious food, you know, nutrition at, at your hand. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, you're, you're, you're uh, trying to simulate something, a process, and that's what we are still doing here. That's what you are seeing here as well, you know, so. In this case, this is an example how we c could move from uh, 2D to 3D in an almost uh, seamless way, and that's also something we're gonna do at the workshop. Uh, just another example from the same process and using the same technique, in this case, using a set of modernist dwellings, creating uh, the latent walk of these images, of these data sets, is interesting because it can reveal the points of the design, the in-between stage space. So the interpolation of data can help to find points of design that lift in the shadow of the data set. So they're not present in what you feed in, but they're generated as something that the algorithm finds relevant to each other. So thus presenting unexpected opportunities for design and hopefully in the future also not for design, but also for solutions that have a broader impact on our communities. So uh, what you can see here is some of these explorations and how we created uh, three-dimensional geometry. And the last project I would like to present is the Dog House, a uh, mid-journey uh, 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 piece for an exhibition in, at the, um, the MAC uh, in Vienna. And here uh, uh, we have uh, sections from mid-journey on the left side and the right, um, in the middle, we see the maximum contrast illustrator version of it uh, for pixel pro uh, projection. 
and then the final 3D model of the exhibition. So mid-journey generated sections and uh, illustrator version to create uh, this three-dimensional object that then was again sectionalized for final fabrication. So here we, you see it's really, very un, really an iterative process and the usual maps of, uh, for production. And a uh, virtual 3D model and then the setup uh, at the actual venue in Vienna. In addition to this research, I'm, I was also uh, teaching fabrication and I also was thinking about how I could introduce uh, artificial intelligence in fabrication into my, into my course. And I just had just started at New York Tech and uh, what you get when you start as a new faculty member, you get a grant. It was, in my case, it was $3,000. <laughs> and I was thinking, okay, what can I do? How can I incorporate AI into, into fabrication? Uh, and uh, I remembered, I remember just dark, deeply that I always wanted to have a, a mascot for our R lab. And I was thinking about the uh, uh, iBot, the uh, robotic companion dog from Sony. And I was looking, researching it for, uh, then and then I found out, oh, it costs 2,999, that's exactly my budget. So, so that's what I acquired then and uh, started to uh, train uh, the, the dog to respond to a um, tool path that an industrial, we also have an industrial robot uh, in, on campus. And I was uh, teaching how, uh, how the, I knew it would follow the movements of, of the fabrication robot so that they could start to interact. So that was my research project. And that's why you see here in this, uh, in this video, the, the dog house, you know, so that we wanted to give him a nice home. So we created the dog house and it was an exhibition until now. I think it's, it's now not, not installed anymore. So the dogs are again back in the US. So. For the exhibition, we got a sponsor to pay two more because one was an exhibition at the Viennese Biennale, the one that we coded with our students. So here, here you can see just um, yeah, shamelessly uh, uh, showing uh, the neural architecture group, that's something that we uh, started uh, because of the interest of there is only a couple of people we knew would be interested in researching that at that time. So, so, when we, uh, so we asked a couple of students, can, can we come together every two weeks over Zoom and have a conversation about it, what we have problems we're facing and how we can help each other. Um, and uh, Daniel Bolochian, Emmanuel Ko, and um, was also uh, sorry I, I'm 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 missing a name here, um, but we also founded the Architecture and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory out of just um, pure scarcity of uh, availability of those tools. I mean we are all we all will be using them and. Everybody else seems to using them, but they're not available to us, right? There is no tool for architectural production that incorporates our AI technology. So we have to, to find our own routine, routines and, 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 and start to designing them ourselves, which is a good thing, but it's also a bad thing because uh, uh, you need to have, have some experts in the field and a, a lot of them to, to, to move as fast as uh, other fields in this technology do. So that's why we started this here. So where you, what you can see here is we started a project like the common house and maybe I can. But no, I cannot. Okay. Uh, well, 
that was my talk today, uh, but this, in this uh, R2L, uh, we are starting to establish a 2D as well as a 3D model database, so everybody can volunteer, can go to the homepage and uh, add your models. There's a video description about how to uh, 3D model objects and then up, uh, upload them to the cloud as well as for plans and sections, uh, for plans and for sections. Uh, so if you are, if you like to volunteer, it would be a pleasure. <laughs> If not, I thank you very much for your patience. You must be exhausted. And <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for your time. All right. Would, would anybody like to ask Sandra anything? Maybe as you guys are thinking, I can start. Um, well, first of all, thank you very much. Oh, did somebody? Ah, Jenny? No, 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 no. You go ahead. Thank you very much for your talk. I really appreciate it. It was fantastic. Jenny, why don't you? Yeah. Thank you for your talk. I was wondering if you think that the process, you mentioned the process of um, creating the AI and selecting and curating the images. Do you think that changes the authorship of the outputs compared to when architects would create like drawings by hand or by computer? I think uh, it's more a question where do we, what do we learn from, you know? So, so I think also as architects, even if we draw uh, uh, sketches our own, how do we uh, experience our world? You know? So how do we learn from it? It, it, it? For me, it was learning from examples from history, I, I was learning architecture from images. Of course, I was immersed in, in, in architecture as uh, I studied in Vienna. It's not the worst place to, to, to Im be immersed in three-dimensional uh, production, but, but uh, it does not make you more or less uh, sensible, I think. It does not make you more or less uh, inquisitive, I don't think. Uh, I think uh, what I'm interested in, in how I always try to incorporate computational techniques was that they help me expand, uh, extend what I can do. So I must, be, must say we all should be very critical of our own productions and, and I know that students are the worst critics. <laughs> I, re I remember myself when I went to a review and I had to present the project, I was not 100% sure. <laughs> I want to, you know, so, so you have to still, you have to somehow find reasonable points in, 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 in what you're doing. And I think you always can do it. And the tool doesn't change that. Uh, thank you for, uh, I appreciate your presentation. There are a lot of good exp uh, examples. And currently, Famous architectural companies use AI in the early stage of the project to create concept, images, or uh, ideas. And also your project or your example use AI in the uh, initial stage or first step. If a, if a project were to be carried out using AI in the entire project, not just the initial stage, what do you think is the most initial things? I've, I've, I think uh, that we need to connect other fields by converting designed buildings into 3D model data. But what do you think about this? Uh, how we, uh, uh, what, what is the most important steps or in, in in creating an overall general tool? Uh, I mean, uh, actually AI made uh, a lot of AI images, but AI images were, are trapped in the virtual uh, world. So how could you make uh, AI images or AI create something into a real world? transition well uh, we we have established now what ml is you know it's not ai it's machine learning what we're applying 
So it's uh, and machine learning systems are very good at at um, at performance optimization. They're good at optimization and they're good at prediction. So they can fulfill specific tasks. I think uh, it's it's not we we probably don't need to create an overall tool that does it all for us. I think it will be more sort of AI is very helpful when we have a specific problem and we need to know how to solve it, and the tool can help us to experience uh, this problem in time. You know, it, when, when we are looking at, uh, when uh, parametric modeling became some a thing, you know, so something, uh, because it was possible for the computer to calculate 20,000 points in space, which was not possible when, as for a human person, right? So So, so use the computer and use AI technology as like as like that, you know. So now that we have uh, we have a tool that can provide a million solutions overnight, yeah, instead of having twenty models, you can have a million models, and that's something we need to be careful about because you will be training those models either when you create your own data sets. Something like uh, practices like Hope Hewitt have done this, and Daniel Bolochian was uh, the driving force behind this. He's one of the uh, and neck architects we liked <laughs> because it was so fitting. So, um, so uh, he 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 established a database of models just from his company, and I think they they might be doing. We might be addressing probably uh, these architects as well. So so they have a. Uh, Humongous output of their own images, so they can start to make a database with this, right? And then train the database on generating a co permeable architecture or produce Sahadit architecture. You know, so so that's that's totally possible. You could do that, but uh, is it really the most helpful way <laughs> to? Us? So I think uh, what what you will be needing needing to do is how to. Uh, establish an, an, an analytical thinking to state a specific problem you want to solve. You know, so it's it's not possible with these tools to tell them I don't like it. You know, you have to find a way how to computerize your your uh, point towards it. So you have to start to uh, talk to the tool as as it allows for, right? And so, so there is, uh, so you have to start to think about, how, okay, uh, the building has a specific geometry, right? So it has specific proportions. It has, it has mass versus volume. It, it sits on a specific condition on the ground and all of these aspects you can solve. Whether this is 2D now or 3D in the future. So it, it, it's, it's just another aspect and, and an analytical tool for you that you, know, that, that you can have a conversation with. And uh, in the, at the moment, it's bad and good for us that we can design these tools actually to our, to our necess uh, necess uh, necessary events. We probably need a bit more funding <laughs> to get really computer scientists involved and, and, and to write uh, algorithms and have data. Specifically, the data sets are a problem at the moment. We are we're hoping for algorithms that can also work on very small data sets. It's also a possibility for the future. But I would not suggest that it's an overall tool that will, you know, you have a project and you press one button and it will spit out uh, the, the, the data for fabrication. I don't think this is uh, this is the the future path. I still think that it will be adjustable to project, but uh, we might consider that in a future generation, uh, we might consider where we use AI rather for logistics. You know, so for to 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 use it more smartly as um, instead of building something, to uh, readapt and uh, readjust existing structures and organize uh, spaces. You know, so uh, I think this uh, this is something where AI could be very helpful and very successful identifying structures uh, that are capable of, of uh, new forms of inhabitants. You know, even in New York now, our mayor has uh, got in and uh, let us makes it easier for 
uh, uh, developers to um, redevelop their or redesign their empty uh, office buildings into housing projects. And if we can help with this kind of uh, or support this movement, I'm totally for it. You know, so I, I would I would totally. Uh, like to uh, work on, on this aspect of architecture, organizing it, feel, thinking about architecture, not so much more about private, public, thinking about more like an Airbnb living situation, a car, public transport, not as being buses anymore, but really being Ubers that are organized in a way that they pick you up individually. They don't, you don't need to have a, a large train, you know, that uses so much energy. It can be electric cars in the future that just passing around. You don't need parking space because they're on the move all the time because the AI can logistically uh, locate them wherever they are needed. And when they're not needed, you don't need to park them. You know, Or your space when you're three months away for uh, a research project or you're getting a grant or just for, for, uh, just for um, reasons of uh, pleasure. You want to go to another place. You can go there. You can... You, can zoom, you can work there, you can, you don't need, uh, I think we, we can reconsider our situation totally and AI can totally predict this in very, very easily, you know, so it, it can help us to find those arguments. And that's where I see the future. Thank you. You uh, use the term beautiful error or uh, glitch. beautiful glitch. glitch. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious if you feel there might be a better term for that. Um, and given your kind of perspective on bias and, you know, that data sets are kind of inherently made with a human eye, a human bias, and uh, kind of inherent to those data sets, do you feel there's a better term that, or have a suggestion for a better term or a better perspective that? At looking at those glitches? Uh, I think we really talked about uh, estrangement and defamiliarization. That's a field that we've been working as designers, uh, whether with or without AI technologies. We have uh, carved this, uh, this field of explorations for a long time, and it's just something I, I, I would say is, is, is a very uh, distinct decision that you can make as a designer. You know, how, how how close or how far would you like to go from something that is expected? And and for me, it was always uh, very easy to go to the to the unexpected route. It's but it's just because I'm just bored something with my own production, I'm not everybody else's, you know. So I'm 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 I'm, I'm really um, I could always appreciate the. The, the quality of some modern housing, for example, you know, that colleagues were building that were, it, it's not my thing, but I, tr I, I try to evaluate this. Uh, and I, I understand the qualities and I think that's how we would like to train the tools. You know, it's, it's uh, to evaluate uh, things also, if you don't personally don't like it, it's still a qualitative, objectively, it has very specific qualities that make it a good object of of art architecture. Also, I don't need to like every piece of art, art, you know, that is produced. And nobody needs to like my piece of art. I'm not making it for people to like it. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not, uh, once you have this state stance, you know, it doesn't matter if the people talk bad about it. I know what, what it stands for and they have specific reason I did it. And that's the way it looks. I, I don't need others, uh, people confirmation on it. On it. Right, so and, and I think that's also how you operate with the glitches. At the end of the day, the best project is the one where you surprise yourself. You would have never thought that you would create something like this. And I think that's what, I'm, what these tools offer, specifically in their infancy, when, when they're not refined yet. I don't know where I'm going with this, but like... Um... You know, the beautiful, what did you say, the, the most beautiful house? And then you showed the house that is also the most beautiful house, but you don't think so. And, um, you know, I think we, especially architecture, creates in, makes an enormous effort um, always to be um, insular somehow. 
we're you know like we we're the avant-garde we have a different understanding of style of what's what's good what's bad uh, you know um, what's the right thing to build and i think the world sees it completely different for the most part right and I wonder if AI couldn't be also an opportunity to um, rethink our position towards that. But what I hear from you is, um, and I, I understand it, but it's like, oh, give me your nice models. But shouldn't it be also an opportunity to democratize somehow the aesthetics, right? Or are we just afraid of that aspect of the AI? I mean, it's the kind of the quote unquote ugly side but I just wonder what you think about the fact that you have a kind of resistance when it doesn't give you what you want. And then I wonder, you just know what you want because you had, a, I presume, a traditional, quote unquote, traditional architectural education where you were kind of indoctrinated to the right thing, right? And so what happens if that kind of falls away and the machine just creates architecture that the masses want? Or, you know, what's, what's your position on, on that? You're raising a very good point. I mean, actually, in a data set, there should not be only uh, good examples. That would be actually a really bad data set with super hundred buyers, you know. So, so, so you actually need to have things that uh, you don't, you personally would not like, you know. But you have to be uh, uh, unifying this this in environment. You know, you, you you're creating the world in this in with this data set. So the the algorithm cannot approach any other information that, 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 that is in it. And you have to provide it so you can teach it that it starts to learn. If it, it cannot learn only from good examples. So it has to have some, some examples that you would not consider as good piece of architecture. They have to come in, but those are easier to get. <laughs> those are easier from Zillow or, you know, th those are data sets that are available. Maybe for some price, but you, you can, it's, it's really hard to get the good uh, uh, architectural historic examples into the database that's what we started doing you know so it's not our own design it's really uh, mainly ar architectural pieces that students and uh, also we would uh, admire so we model them accordingly and the other data sets that uh, uh, that could come from developers or from governmental resources Yeah, I have a question that is very much like Roger's and I think um, hopefully addresses what you were just saying. And I guess the way I've been thinking about it during your talk is there, there seems to be an impulse to discipline AI. In, in other words, turn its output into recognizable media and modalities of architecture, mm -hmm. plans, sections, exploded axos, um, uh, scale models, um, but so the, the, on, on the one hand, you know, that's a kind of, maybe this isn't fair, but it seems like a fairly conservative project, you know, like let's figure out how AI can be incorpor incorporated into the discipline as we know it. So the, the problem with the data sets um, is a problem because the discipline isn't represented robustly enough with 3D models or images or labeling of images and, and so on. But I wonder what you think of those who I guess I would count myself among who try to think of AI in a different way, um, maybe because I'm not as sophisticated technically, but as a more avant-garde medium, you know, or media, you know, that somehow the very uh, processes, the very kinds of data processing and intelligences that AI is bringing to that pale data set converts it into something potentially startling, you know, not only unfamiliar, but, you know, almost incomprehensible, you know, and so, so like the, um, I thought the, the robot garden, that last image you showed of it with the sort of imposed, uh, images, you know, it's almost like that's the robot's idea of, of architecture, right? They, they see it as all these data points or navigation points or impediments or uh, scales or, or whatever. You know, so it's a little bit like animal intelligence. You know, we, we, don't, we don't know how smart bats are because we don't 
we, we can't enter their mind, right? We can't think like them. So may I ask uh, what platform are you working with? When you Just readily available stuff, all, all the mm -hmm. different uh, large language models and um, uh, generative imaging programs, you know, anything. <laughs> yeah, I think I, I presented probably some artists' work that might fall probably more into what you're looking for. At the moment, they are also working with imagery mainly, but also music and, and uh, uh, literature. The thing is uh, that you always have to ask the model a specific question. And then the model is decided which one, you know, you have probably the data. And then uh, you, you, you need somebody who tells you, oh, that, that would be a good model for, for, what your, for your research question. So it's not such explorative in a tool that then, oh, I don't know what to really do. So it's, it's really you have to have a specific question to the, to the model, to the machine learning model. And then you can ask, of course, uh, explore the universe, you know, so just or just do it. But you have to find a way how to com uh, communicate this computationally. Right. So explore the universe. Maybe you want to go to CERN. You know, they have a lot of data that is free. So why not go there and capture what data they gather? every day and, and do something with it. But it's, 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 it's not such a passive way of you know, organizing elements in an image or organizing elements in space, hopefully in the future. It's, it's more like uh, you willingly ask a question. And of course, today I presented architectonic examples of our explorations, not to say that we don't uh, explore, uh, produce images that are uh, ex uh, exciting for us. But uh, as long as it's not in an exhibition, I don't need to share it. You know, so it's it's something that is uh, that is uh, uh, yeah that uh, attracts. Uh, I understand what you would like to have the tool to be, but I think it's not. It's it's really it's really this data set, and then you have a, an, an an algorithm, and there is no magic behind these things. It's it's really. I'm not talking about magic. I'm I'm just saying. That is it the is the the twenty first century potential of AI uh, a matter of incorporating it into the discipline as we know it, or do you think if it's not your project that others would have a project to explode the discipline in the same way that avant gardists of the early twentieth century thought of doing things like that? Well, I hope our students will. <laughs> we, we work hard together with them to 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 explore this field. You know, it's 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 for them. It's 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 for you. It's it's not so much for us. You know. So it, we 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 we're, we're trying to understand it, and I try to use it in 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 many ways. Whatever the project is, I'm working on. If it, it if it would be a sponsored research for for housing, I would devote my time to doing that. You know. If, if I, if I'm uh, to have an exhibition, I devote my time and channel it into a different project, using similar tools. So I understand what you mean, and I think uh, I understand uh, that there is the potential is there, but the, it's, it's still you will have to ask a question to the tool. It doesn't do anything on its own. You really have to be very specific about it, and and that's the 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 the, the beauty of and the disadvantage of computational design at the moment, the, the boundaries are our understanding of how our brain works. So since we have not really an answer to that question, it's hard for the computer to, to simulate or twin this, this environment. But I think uh, what algorithms are not mimicking, we have to face the reality. Machine learning is not mimicking uh, how we think. That was the goal, but it's not, it, it, it's not, not happening at the moment. So, uh, but we are now we have different tools and different intelligence and artificial intelligence that is different from ours and that does different things much better than we do. So we can be the creative part and the machine can be part of it, but it can also do some mundane tasks that we are probably tired of. And that's probably the struggle that you see in my presentation, you know, so applying it to different fields and not presenting 
uh, my personal position, but rather some projects that we've been working on. So. So you mentioned that a next step in your project is to get a database of many 3D models. How do you plan to get so many models in a number that is helpful to your research? Is it like an algorithm that needs to be written or is it something more manual? But it seems like you're going to need a lot of them. How will you get them? Well, thank you for the question. I, this is um, uh, uh, the summer's, my summer's work was <laughs> to three months in subtropical climate modeling 3D models, unfortunately. Uh, it's not very successful um, uh, uh, to, to have synthetic data that is automatically generated. So it should be as manual as possible. Now we have a database of 10,000 models, which is a good way to start it. So, but uh, part of them are also um, synthetically generated by me applying machine learning program in, in, in Grasshopper. To, to manipulate the different shapes and forms. So part of it is already synthetic, so I, I told the data scientists, you have to work with it. <laughs> I'm not modeling another summer, you know? <laughs> so, and, uh, and we had really a great uh, volunteer, um, a former student of ours, who was in his free time also providing many, many models. We will definitely mention his name whenever we are going to use and publish this database <laughs> publicly. So uh, yeah, it was a, 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 a labor of love, <laughs> simply. All right. Well, thank you so much, Sandra. Thank you so much for staying here with me so long. Thank you. Um, we will be meeting in 104, so over here in this room, yeah. <laughs>